Ladies and gentlemen, everyone around and in between, this is Debate Sensei and FALD edition. This is where we talk about things relevant to competitive debate for the National Forensics Association, Lincoln Douglas. Uh, I have with me uh, two people that are very high up <clears throat> in the ranks of this fun organization, Dr. Justin Kirk, Director of Debate at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, and Chad Meadows, Director of Debate at Western Kentucky University. Thank you both. Thanks for having us. Thank All you. right. You know what? Uh, so I understand we have ourselves a visual aid. I think that's a great place to get started. Uh, we do. So one of the one of the nice features about the Grand Prix, and I have to give Chad and Eric Morris all the credit in the world for starting this tournament. This was their brainchild. It is the premier tournament of the year, I think, aside from nationals. It is probably yeah. tougher than nationals. And when you win the Open Division, you get a traveling trophy. You get to take home and put in your trophy case for the year. Nice. Uh, the steering wheel. So, like, I was wondering where what the, the influence for Grand Prix. So, it still is, like, an race-themed thing? It, it yeah. is. I think, Chad, that's a good question for Chad. Okay. Uh, that's that's Ermo's idea. Um, so, we just, like, kind of had the idea of having, like, a second uh, national tournament for LD. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't we wanted it to be very unique from nfa and not detract in any way from nfa um and so you know we were just kicking around the ideas and i was like name i don't know uh like what sounds good and uh dr eric morris proposed uh the ld grand prix and i was like that sounds so cool yeah i love that so yeah oh was, a little bit of a rhyme okay yeah all right where's it held it's a rotating location so okay. it's kind of held in a different spot every year um sure. if i remember correctly the first year wasn't it at missouri state yeah, it was at Missouri State for a couple of years, um, and then last year was at North Texas, and this year it's at WKU. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, so but the hybrid's like a big part of the Grand Prix, so I mean, people also enter online. Mm -hmm. All right, Justin, you already talked a little bit about the significance of this tournament, but part of your description, you're saying that in some ways it's more difficult than nationals. Mm -hmm. Why so is that? Um, there's a couple of reasons why that's true. The first is there's an entry cap in each division. Oh. So varsity, JV, and novice all have entry caps, which means that you're only putting your top four or five debaters in that division. Mm -hmm. um, and so open is the top four or five debaters from every squad on the circuit um, in, a, in a pool that's probably smaller than nationals. But the thing that we tell our debaters before the Grand Prix is there are no easy debates. Mm -hmm. You don't get an easy debate at this tournament in prelims because you're debating people who will be probably clearing it open in every prelim round at nationals okay okay so it's like you're distilling down the um the the competition uh mm -hmm. in, in more more concentrated form is is the difficulty there yeah right? and, I, and i think the other big difficulty of it is day two is a marathon um yeah. i i would compare day two most closely to like monday at the ndt um okay. because it's double elimination um, which means that you can lose twice before you're out. Mm. Um, and Ooh. there's a lot of people still competing. And so we will run debates from probably 8 a.m. Um, I think there was one year that Nick and I were awake till 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning debating. Um, the cleaning people had left the building on campus. We were oh. <laughs> That's how late the Grand Prix ran that year. Um, so it's, it's just a marathon. And you have to be mentally and physically prepared for day two at the Grand Prix. No oh, man, my my son just went to a, a a chess tournament. He's been getting way into chess, and so speaking of a marathon, he had like two four hour games back to back. Uh, you know, so like I I just just sitting there, like you're just sitting there, but you're thinking yeah. for eight hours straight. You know what I mean? He's like, well, we did that study on chess players like burn seven or eight thousand calories in grandmaster level games. Wow. Just sitting there thinking about the, the, the process. They like burn as many calories as like Olympians do. Oh man. Yeah. And I remember back in the day when I was doing d uh, debate tournaments, I, I would forget to eat. Um, like at the end of the day, I was all cramped up in my stomach. So I could just imagine uh, even higher stakes than, than that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I I am a little fascinated by by the trophy. So this is a traveling trophy. Um, mm -hmm. Is it to the winner, or is there some other? It, what, is that it the goes to the individual winner of the tournament? The individual winner. So oh. whoever survives day two and wins finals uh, yeah. gets this beautiful trophy to take with them. Okay. Um, and you know, I think historically, 
Um, Western Kentucky was the first team to win it. And then Missouri State won it the year of COVID. I think, yeah, Gabe Morrison won the year. We postponed it till June and had it online. Um, and then Nick won it the third year. Madeline and Tess closed it out in finals the fourth year, uh, which is a pretty impressive feat. Yeah. Um, having two debaters that deep. Um, and also, if anybody knows Madeline and Tess, they know that like that was absolutely in their DNA to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then last year, Nick won it in a what what I, I was told was an epic debate between him and Andre from Western Kentucky. Okay. okay. And very much what was seen as kind of the premier debate of the year on last year's topic. I was, yeah, I was asking because like some of the traveling trophies I'm familiar with go to like for sweepstakes or there is like a rotating. I just wanted to, to clarify that. Uh, I love the fact that it is double elimination. Like my experience with double elimination is from the NPTE. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's what influenced this. And I don't know what influenced uh, uh, double elims at NPTE. Um, what it, like, tell me a little bit more about uh, uh I mean, Chad, you're the one who came up with this. So the decision to go double Elims. Oh, yeah. Like you, I'm a uh, old parley head. So um, <laughs> my favorite tournament and the one I did the best at was the NPTE. Um, and I, I don't know, always loved that tournament. It was like the thing that it was like my nationals, basically. Yeah. Uh, and so like I a lot of this was like feeling like LD was kind of missing that niche of like the L, uh, of like what the NPTE Brought to, uh, brought to Parley, so um, double Elims just kind of felt like a good fit. Also, like, I mean, a lot of it was, like, we were looking for ways to distinguish it from the national tournament mm -hmm. because we don't want to just, like, have another national tournament and, like, have people either skip NFA or, like, uh, <clears throat> just feel like they're repeating the same thing over again. That We wanted something that was, like, completely unique. Okay. <clears throat> other than double e limbs, is there any other sort of, um, you know, tournament differences that, that would be unique? Um, like more uh, debate round, like more prelim rounds or like at MPTE, they had two judges per prelim. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else like that? So no, it's one per prelim uh, and we only do five rounds. Five? Um, okay. Because another big part of the Grand Prix is that we want get to it, get it done in two days. Mm. Um, so we don't want to, we might, I don't know. I've always like kicked around like the thought, maybe we should go to a three day, but at, at least like the original ethos of the tournament was, we also wanted something that would be fast and cheap. Right. Um, because like NFA is like long, it's yeah. a slog. There's not many rounds a day. So this was like to do a tournament that, um, would not cost as much money for teams to attend. Right. Um, and then, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, the NFA, they, it, that's uh, all one division, right? They, they don't. Yeah, it's just an open division. So that's another part of it is that uh, we're offering a chance for, you know, like novices and junior varsity students to win something akin to a, a, turn, a national tournament. So uh, other inspirations were uh, the ADA from Policy Debate. Okay. Uh, they also have uh, like a national tournament that includes a, a varsity, JV, and novice division. Uh, and then also inspired by the ADA was. Uh, they gave out like a lot of awards, mm -hmm. um, which uh, we do as well. We have an All-American team that we give out. Um, we have a Coach of the Year award. We have an Emerging Debater of the Year award. Um, we have... award. What was that? System? There's like a Community or Debater's Choice Award as oh, well. Yeah, right. Debater's Choice Award. Uh, so yeah, that, that was another thing that I like wanted to do with the tournament was just to like celebrate you know like ld because at nfa it's like it's it's so there's so many events right like right. it would be weird to be like pros of the year <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so like um but at the grand prix it's like just the little ld community and so i think that we can also you know kind of love on each other a little bit and, and offer some appreciation for what everybody brought to the season well that's that's awesome that's great um so was the, was the reigning coach of the year last season. So. Oh yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Ah, nice. Um, okay. So now the, the title of this episode is prepping for mm -hmm. the grand prix. Um, we've, we've just discussed how the grand prix as a tournament is different. How does that affect your mindset? Your, uh, you know, going into the tournament, like w what are some, some, unique approaches that, that you think are, are different for this one? Yeah. I mean, I would say that like the mentality going into this tournament is very much like you would be if, if you're an NCAA basketball player going to the NCAA tournament, which is survive in advance. 
Okay. You know, especially if you go three, two and you get out at the Grand Prix, mm -hmm. you just, you have to debate every round in front of you and you can't worry two, three rounds down the road because there's so much good competition there. If you skip on a round or if you don't think about a round, you know, you could be down two E limbs and be out of the tournament before you know it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of like tip one, which is like, you got to like focus on every round and every round matters. Um, the other thing is, you know, I, I think that there's a little bit of innovation. Okay. Kind of what I tell my debaters is like nothing super new that's good is usually getting broken at the Grand Prix. Okay. If it's that good, they're saving it for NFA. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. You know so, what I mean? Like, so you've yeah. got a month between the, the Grand Prix and Nationals. I would say that if you if, the, if that argument is that good, it's probably not coming out at the Grand Prix. Some version of it might. Some like proto version of a new AF or a new critique argument or a new disad might be showing up. But for the most part, I think people are just going to refine and make the best version of the arguments they've been successful with during the regular season. And if you prep that way, I think you're much more successful at the Grand Prix because you're not trying to like chase down 50 new arguments. Right. That's nationals. That The Grand Prix is like, here are the five best arguments we've got. Let's like tech them out, get okay. the best pieces of evidence we have, and then roll with those arguments and see how well we do. Okay. Okay. Um, so would you say that the... You, you talked about like innovating uh, new arguments. Um, you're keeping the same apps, but like, would you say that more of the innovation might be coming from like the neg trying to like leverage more stuff? Like, it, are, are they just updating links? Are they doing a, a different sort of impact level analysis? What are you thinking? So I think that, you know, people are going to go over your app with more of a fine tooth comb. Okay. You know, they're going to look, you know, and just find the shortcuts that everyone has to take a little bit when you're writing it out. Right. right? So, you know, they're going to find the advantage counter plan hidden in your internal link. They're going to find, you know, like an alt cause in your link, et cetera. Right. So, you know, I think that there's like just more of a sense that your opponent has really gone through the materials that you generally present and uh, sort of like, uh, presented their neg arguments in sort of the best way to position themselves um, against your affirmative. And so, you know, I think, you know, the biggest thing is just, I agree with uh, Justin that, you know, in terms of the mentality beyond the just like number of rounds and how back to back that they are, um, I think that you just gotta like mentally pre prepare yourself for, you know, debates that are challenging um, mm -hmm. and that are happening over and over again. Uh, and the other thing is that, because it's double elims and we're, it's constantly resorting the bracket, right. you never like get, you never know who you're hitting next, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So like mm -hmm. one, I think thing that makes day two, you know, like even more challenging is that on a traditional single elim bracket, you get your bracket, right? And you know, okay, yeah. I'll hit this person, this person, this person, and you can kind of just like, you know, prep the round. So it's like your debaters debating, maybe like the coaches who aren't judging, you're like prepping you for the next round, right? You can't really do that at the Grand Prix because let's say that you're in like the winner's division, the winner's bracket. Right. You lose that debate. You have no clue who you're debating. Even if you win, you don't know who you're debating. Right. So uh, there's a lot more, I think, variation uh, in terms of round to round who you're going to hit. Um, and so, yeah, I agree. Like trying to, uh, to, to prep too much for like new stuff. I just, I don't know. It doesn't really work that well at the Grand Prix. Okay. One thing I will say, like to add on to Chad's thing is all these debates. 95% of them at the Grand Prix are extremely close. Okay. And so in, in preparing for the Grand Prix, thinking about how do I win those close debates where like one issue or one turn of phrase changes the entire scope of the debate or the framing of the debate for the judges. I mean, these debates are decided on like a piece of evidence or one extension argument that a debater makes that they wouldn't have made in a previous debate. Um, I've watched some debates at, at the Grand Prix that I thought, man, this is the closest debate I've seen in this activity in six years. Um, and all the debates are like that. Mm -hmm. So I think another way to mentally prepare yourself is like pay attention to details. Mm -hmm. It's the little things at the Grand Prix that matter. Okay. Um, the nuance, the like, are you articulating the, the evidence you're reading in the right way? Or are you... I mean, I think Chad's advice about like start doing some self-examination of yourself. I mean, almost like a op research in a political campaign. Have one of your teammates go through your app and be like, where are all the weaknesses here? Right. How do I close these down? How do I prepare when they read that advantage counter plan against us that they found in our solvency card, just like Chad's JV debater did in finals of JV. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, 
but but like I think that 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 that's something to keep in mind is these debates are not blowouts. There's you're not going to have an easy debate. You're not going to have a debate that's not close. Um, every every round, every judge is going to be judging on tiny little distinctions, and so you've got to be on your A game in every debate to know that like you got overcoming the kind of like temptation to like go big picture. Okay, so like you, you talk about how there's not a whole lot of change. Um, and since I'm unfamiliar with like the same topic for, for a, a year long, um, I've had students in the past where, uh, you know, they're in parley and they, they, they run one case and it doesn't do well. And they were practicing it, right? They, they had it mm -hmm. prepped and, 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 and they, they didn't win on it. They're like, okay, we have to completely overhaul this. Uh, let's say you have a, a debater that they, 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 they prepped out a, a case or a neg and it just didn't work. How likely is it that they're just going to try again, basically the same arguments, but just in front of another judge? I think it's pretty likely. I think especially if those arguments have been successful with other debaters or on other circuits. Oh, right? okay. yeah, Something I try to remind my debaters of is if you're losing with an argument that other debaters are winning with, uh, look at what they're doing differently. Uh, you know? Right. Like, Right. I can't win with this NFU app. It's like, well, that's what Western Kentucky's top debater, Ray Fournier, has been reading all uh -huh. year. And they seem to be pretty <laughs> successful with that app. So, like, there's a disconnect between what you're doing and what the successful debaters are doing with that affirmative. And I think that's the starting point. Of, like, what are you not doing that the debaters who are winning with these arguments are doing? And then the second thing is, like, you know, maybe they're just not seeing the debate in the same way that the mm -hmm. judges are. Um, a lot of it's communication. I Chad judged one of my first years this year. And the way that they responded to Chad's like kind of round vision was like, oh, maybe I am making a lot of like nuanced level mistakes in my kind of nice. seeing the round. Um, and I think a lot of times debaters who are losing on an argument all year, or you need to just kind of like re-envision how that argument functions vis-a-vis -vis other arguments in debate, or maybe, you know, kind of rework it, but don't abandon arguments because if somebody else is winning on it, there it's the, the argument's there, you know? And, yeah. and sometimes what we'll do with the Grand Prix is basically, if we've got an app that like we think that we're gonna read at NFA and we're not like saving it for like a one-off like thing, it's like no, we're probably just gonna like read this like as like one of the first apps that we read at NFA. So the surprise factor is not that important. We yeah. might just read it at the Grand Prix and like have a bunch of debates with it and see, you know, like how it does. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it can be like a good testing ground because you're generally gonna get pretty good judges. Um, and so like you're gonna get pretty good feedback most of the time uh, on the arguments that that you're you know testing out and trying so when you're talking about paying attention to nuance that it sounds like it's not necessarily new research right like a, a, a how much of how much of the 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 debate is scripted by what i mean is not just reading what other people say but uh, reading what you sort of wrote where you 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 sat down and thought about the words that you're going to use and how much of it is off the cuff and you got to kind of adapt in the moment uh so okay so in this scenario that it's like an app that, that that's been read before right i would say like for like most top debaters the in the in the everything up from the ac to the nc has been scripted 100 percent really uh, 100%. Yeah. okay i mean you know it's for your prepared students who are like taking this you know really seriously and they're they're i mean there's a wiki they're looking up the the case beforehand and they're going through it they're making their ncs and if nothing changes about the app they're probably just reading the nc they prep which i mean i, I would say like in 75 80 percent of debates that i watch even like you know debates with novice and jv the one nc doesn't take any prep time right uh, because i mean you you've got generally you've got a coach or someone a ga someone's helping you in the pre-round Kind of the norm for like a uh, evidence activity is you get 30 minutes of pre-round prep too you know so pretty much everything from the ac to the nc is usually pretty prepped out now okay. if it's a new app then i mean yeah it's yeah 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 you're you're but you, typically like we will have like here's our strat if somebody breaks new against you here are three yeah. here are three topic disads here's a topic k here's a t argument that's like a catch-all topicality argument that yeah. should work against the app and here's like a bunch of solvency takeouts that work just generally on the resolution i think most teams will have a generic nc for new apps of like this tests a bunch of different levels of the affirmative yeah okay. good debaters don't spend spend three minutes spending their wheels trying to like write a negative strategy in prep time 
Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you've just got to kind of, I mean, take a little prep, take a moment. Maybe there's some like fun things you can do, but yeah, you, you don't want to spend a bunch of time pretending as if as you sit there, you're going to like come up, you know, with like a brilliant NC. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's an evidence-based activity. So it's like, you've got to have cards to like support right. your arguments. So yeah, I mean, I think even in new app situations, you don't want to spend too much time. I, I'll say more useful at the Grand Prix than new apps is typically like new versions of a critique yeah. you've been reading all year or a new version of a dis ad with like a new internal link or a new scenario. Mm-hmm. That the debater's going to just like, oh, it's the deterrence dis ad and pull out their deterrence front line. And you've got a different kind of spin on it than you used to. Yeah. It's the same argument, but it's got a different kind of, and that's what I mean about paying attention to nuance. People are going to show up with same arguments. They're going to have the same titles, same kind of idea structure, but something's going to be different in there that they're going to try and leverage in the later point of the debate. You've got to figure out what that is um, right. so that you can anticipate kind of what the NR is going to do with that dis or what the affirmative is going to do with that new internal link that they've read. Mm. Um, why is it different? What u- utility does it have for them later in the debate is a really useful exercise. Um, because I think you're going to see a lot more new arguments at the Grand Prix on the negative than you will on the affirmative. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm starting to starting to see that. Would you say that the Grand Prix is a little bit more technical than other tournaments? Like, I don't know. Is it is it faster? Uh, like, because uh, I know at some tournaments we'd go, okay, we got to really step back and work on our delivery and our presence. And the other ones were like, we got to buckle down and we got to read more. Um, what do you think about the Grand Prix? It's, it's judge dependent, but I think for the most part, the Grand Prix is like your kind of coach, like the core of your coaching and judging pool from the year. So these okay. are people who judged a ton of debates. They're very familiar with the topic literature. So it is kind of a situation where you can use more enthamine, right? More um, kind of implication as opposed to explicit argumentation because judges right. are going to know what's going on. Um, whereas at other tournaments, there's always a risk that somebody hasn't judged a bunch of rounds or is more of a parley slash PF lay judge um, right. or a speech judge. Um, and that, But the Grand Prix, I think these judges, these debaters are people who've been on the circuit all year, who mm. expect kind of faster, more technical debate. And even if it's not faster, it's certainly more technical on the yeah. like argumentation level of like, we know what the evidence says. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, the the double elimination format uh, when when I went to NPTE uh, you know we uh, we broke and we eventually knocked out the the top seed and the way that it just turned out was that I we got two buy rounds out of that in the elims and straight into sims um, does stuff like that happen at this tournament yeah uh, yes. so we're trying our best to figure out the math on how to prevent that from happening as much. <laughs> yeah, it was um, nice, I, don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would point to the year uh, that uh, Madeline and Tess closed out. The way the math worked out, somehow, Madeline had like the easiest path mm-hmm. like ever. I feel like she got like a buy or two, like ended up getting a lot of pull-ups. Uh, and so like, yeah, like, so what we're trying to do is advance the magic numbers to the double double elims okay. there's some magic numbers for double elims that work really well for instance 16 is yeah. like a yeah. really good number uh and so like we're always trying to like tinker a little bit with like how we're going to do um you know like the lead up to the double elims to kind of get it closer to those even magic numbers that don't create as many buys you know because those situations they're fun for the student, but like ultimately, like you shouldn't make the same case with two buys. Yeah. <laughs> or in Madeline's case, I win the tournament with two buys. Yeah. Do okay in, in prelims. Do you do you uh, break brackets? Because we uh, had to hit our own team sometimes when we were in prelims. Uh no, there's there's no. You're never hitting your own. You no. never hit your own team because okay. So like the uh, what happened was you said, I don't was, I don't know how that would work in an evidence based activity. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> like if you're reading the diss ad that I wrote against me, like <laughs> we're fighting. <laughs> yeah, like because there's two judges, there is like this whole dynamic where like, hey, let's just let's just ask them to split 
the ballots, you know what I mean? And then we'll each get one and we both can advance and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's one of the, but everyone with a three, two advances, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you can't really, it's like kind of hard to hit that magic number that way. Cause I don't know, like, you know, it, it's all dependent on how the, how the brackets work out or how the, how the prelims work out. Well, and I'm, I'm not in tab for the Grand Prix, but we do break brackets for double elims, right, Chad? Yes. Uh, oh, okay. So <laughs> some of these things, uh, not 100% sure on because we're like still somewhat kicking. Historically, yes, we have broken brackets and everyone who's 3-2 is broken. Uh, this year, we are considering basically like doing a poll and being like, would not breaking brackets make everyone mad? <laughs> uh, yeah. Because it would make things a lot easier. Uh, in terms of the math, um, and, and then in terms of judge coverage, right? judge especially coverage. during that, those first couple of elims where everybody's in, yeah, the judging no, is very it's, tight, it's right, player. right, right, right. Because I mean, you like you only have the so many teams that came, and uh, all of, yeah, that makes it tough. That makes it really tough. All right. Um, so as a coach, as a coach, what are you telling your students? What is the mm -hmm. Uh, what are the day-to-day -day things? It's like, all right, Grand Prix coming up. This is how we're going to handle it. Uh, I mean, the first thing for any tournament, what I do is first just go with the app strategy. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, what apps are we reading, after we reading, and then when are we breaking which ones? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we're going to reprise something old, if we're going to break something new, if we're going to revise something we've been reading, you know, like when when is that, when is that happening? Uh, mm -hmm. is what I like to do, you know, and I have to like think about it, not just from a round perspective, but also like from a situation perspective, you know, like if we've got an app that we think is like great against someone who like would read the critique, we might be like, okay, who are the like four or five or six or whatever number it is debaters that we think that when we're app and there is a neg critique that we have like a reasonable shot to lose that debate. Uh, and it's like, okay, in that circumstance, if we're hitting that person, we are for sure reading the app and you know that helps to like i, I like doing that because it helps to eliminate decision fatigue in the moment mm. right like it's it's easy to just like talk about that like in bowling green uh kentucky uh yeah. but then like when you're at the tournament and it's like i'm tired and like i'm not just thinking about debate a thing that like students don't think about is that like i'm not thinking about just their debate or all the other students debate i'm also thinking about like how, where is lunch yeah. And how are we going to get everywhere safely? Uh, and, you know, a lot of different, you know, things that, you know, go into it. So I like to plan as much out about app strategy as we possibly can uh, at home. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. The food part is uh, way more important than I ever realized. And you were talking about how day two is just a marathon. So mm -hmm. interestingly, one of the ways to prepare, prepare for a debate is to think about like what you could bring, like some like easy yeah. food that's uh, travel, you know what I mean? You could carry with you everywhere that you go. Yeah. And I, I mean, I would say the other thing that I like, I, especially my younger debaters, because we've got a very young squad this year. We only have four people who are not a first or second year mm. is the Grand Prix is a great, great opportunity for you to spend all of spring break getting your files correct and eliminating any fluff. If you're not reading those cards in a debate, why is that file in your tub? Mm -hmm. If you're not using critique arguments, why do you even have critique arguments in your neg tub, right? Mm -hmm. um, start narrowing down what you're looking at in pre-round prep, in round prep, um, any of those things, just get more focused, get more detailed, get more in depth, especially for younger debaters. They think that like, oh, I got to cover everything. I got to have 50 disads and five counter plans. It's like, no, three or four disads and a couple of good counter plans and a critique argument that you're familiar with will do wonders for you. And just getting that stuff right, blocking everything out that you've got a good extension card for. We were having a practice debate the other day, and one of my debaters was like, what do I say to this piece of evidence? And I told the other debater, I was like, that's the card you should be blocking out. If mm. they don't know how to respond to it, you want, like, extend this card. Here are five arguments, right? <laughs> Thinking about those things before the Grand Prix is really useful. What pieces of evidence do I have that other debaters are afraid of? How can I leverage those better in debate? And how can I narrow my focus mm -hmm. so that I'm really, really near, like laser targeted on the things that win me debates. It sounds like the, like, even though research is still an important part, the research burden isn't really the core of, of Grand Prix prep that it's, it's maybe a little bit more about like, how am I, 
how am I saying this? Like, it, it, should I rewrite this? Like how, like, or reorder it or things like that? Am I getting this right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah because at this point in the season, like there are like themes that define the topic and it's like very obvious uh, that what those themes are. If, if, if you've been debating all year in particular. Uh, and so like you, you probably have most of what you need somewhere on that computer <laughs> now whether or not you know where it is okay whether or not you know what it says whether or not it's been highlighted correctly whether or not oh, it's that's like a good point. tagged well you yeah. know that i think is the rub and so i totally agree with justin's saying it's you know you could you could try to like generate five new dissads and 10 new apps etc you know and for some people you know like if if they're very experienced you know, they might break something new at the Grand Prix, honestly, because if they might be kind of bored or just kind of like, you know, they they're kind of ready to go on the basics. Some people have, but you're the vast majority of debaters on this topic have not yet mastered the basics. Oh. Uh, they're decent on them, but they've not mastered those basics yet. Right. And so, you know, I think the Grand Prix is a great opportunity to spend most of your prep time, like really figuring out your stuff. Mm -hmm. um and, and getting it in order uh for opponents who are going to really challenge it because if you think about it you know if, if you do, even if you just think about grand prix as prep for nfa you know yeah. like at nfa you're gonna hit a bunch of new crap right mm -hmm. it's the last tournament there's nothing there's nowhere to hold it back for and then if you're hitting new stuff what do you need you need your core generics and right. you need them to be good and so, yeah, I mean, I think even if just using your Grand Prix as a chance to like really make your core generics great, you know, that's going to help you for NFA too. Okay. It's a significantly different perspective than at the beginning of uh, the season at first tournaments and things like that. So I'm, I'm hoping that maybe, you know, somebody who's going to the Grand Prix is watching this and uh, maybe it, it helped them out. So, uh, thank you both so much for providing some of that uh, insight on what it, the prep looks like for this prestigious tournament. Uh, Justin, Chad, I will see you again in the future. Sounds thank you. Thank you so much. All right.